Am I the only one who feels like Congress is definitely the awkward third wheel for these railway labor debates? Oh, employees want better contracts from their private employers? Sounds like a perfect job for not Congress. Now, I guess what I'm trying to figure out with this whole episode today is how did this private labor dispute turn into a situation where the House and Senate are debating how many sick days to give Thomas the tank engine? Now, I don't say this often on my channel, but this whole situation definitely feels like a problem below Congress's pay grade and in an entirely separate department. So what's going on here? Well, this whole story begins back in 1926 when Congress passed the Railway Labor Act. It was the Roaring Twenties. Mussolini's got those trains running on time in Italy. Let's take a stab at it out here. The plan, pretty simple. Can't have a train strike killing our high. Let's set up a process for avoiding those strikes. Now, this process was justified by Congress's ability to regulate interstate commerce and has been successfully defended in front of the Supreme Court. Back then, the Supreme Court ruled that Congress had the authority to intervene in railway labor disputes that threaten trade access across state lines. The ability to grind the nation to a halt was determined to be too much unchecked negotiating power to give to one group in these bargains. Now, because of this, a special railroad negotiation program was set up by Congress. All right, first, workers and barons, set aside your differences and figure out your own contracts. Second, well, step one didn't work at all. Congress is now going to set up some mediated talks to hopefully Dr. Phil you guys into finding some sort of agreement. Third, well, that didn't work either. Congress is now going to either add more time to those discussions, take a large step back and just sort of let things play in their natural course, probably involving a strike, or just sort of dictate a new contract because neither side can come to their own agreement. We've got the guns at the end of the day and if you strike against the contract Congress worked so hard to negotiate amongst themselves, well that's now a crime. At this point, I'm not sure if those union dues would be better spent as Joe Manchin campaign contributions. Now, using a campaign finance tracking website, I can definitively tell you that the employers of those railway workers were making substantial donations to support the many packs of both political parties. Ah, so now I understand why everyone was able to come together to such a fast agreement. Bipartisanship is still alive and well in this country. Now, in today's story, Congress has already tried both A and B, so now we're just kind of legislating the terms of an agreement between railway workers and private railroad companies. Today's House of Representatives is truly the highest HR in the land. This leaves everyone in Congress answering tricky questions like how many sick days should we give these railway employees? What type of raises should they be getting? And is this communism? Yeah, we're just kind of going to gloss over the last question in the mainstream coverage of this issue. Now, this isn't the first time that Congress has dipped their toe into the world of railroad contract negotiations. In the past, it's happened 18 times, spanning from 1863 to today. Although the last time they mandated everyone accept a contract they had written was two years before I was born in 1991. Now the majority of those 18 congressional interventions were to say, hey workers, don't strike. Let's talk it out in arbitration. Come to an agreement with your bosses? Cool. Now still, there have been a few previous occurrences where that talking it out session took a turn for the Jerry Springer leading Congress to walk out in front of everyone and give them all an offer that they couldn't refuse. Gotta prevent those strikes and protect those interstate supply chains. Now, of course, looking at today and our political and economic landscape, yikes, there is not much appetite for the sit back and see what happens approach. These railway talks have been going on for months now and not much progress has been happening on some key issues. Strike and congressional action seem to be emerging as the only two possible solutions. And because striking, well that's probably out of the question for most politicians right now, 
The debate was really over which employee contracts Congress should impose on these private companies and the people who they employ. Members of Congress were looking at two separate employment contracts that had been negotiated between themselves in lieu of that pesky negotiating between unions and employers. Now the controversy really came down to paid sick days. In the end, Biden burned quite a few bridges by urging the Democrats to vote for a compromise bill that didn't include paid sick leave and required taking unpaid time off for medical appointments during a pandemic. And Congress said, "Hey, we're not going to bite the hand that feeds us." So this was deemed the only bill that could pass in the Senate, and it did with bipartisan support. So now that's the new contracts between private railroad employees and their companies. Now these contracts did include other benefits for workers, including a previously agreed to 24% raise and bonus pay. Now to summarize this meandering sort of stream of consciousness episode in a sentence or two, the House and Senate just voted to impose, and boy is it an imposition, a labor agreement between freight rail companies and their workers who have been locked in a stalemate, moving quickly to avoid a holiday season rail strike that would jeopardize shipping across the country. Phew, I guess we really dodged a bullet train there. Now at the same time, the fact that Congress has not only the power but also the ability to impose a deal between employees and private companies, and furthermore ban striking as a response to that, is, well frankly it's pretty eye opening and I don't think it's getting very much attention or questioning from anybody. Well, didn't know they could do that. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. If you liked this episode, give me a thumbs up and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.